we're at Code Stock. This is the Dodo Bird Talk. It's the last session of the last day. Oh, I know. I think I cheering myself. <laughs> we want to thank our sponsors, RecruitWise. Their CEO talked at the keynote yesterday and he said he appreciates everybody because we're the ones who put fam food on his family's table. So I think that's a sign of a really good recruiter, somebody who cares about the people they work with. Rocks Press. I like this publisher in particular because the company I work at, Gravity Works, my boss, Jeff McWhorter, has published a couple of books through Rocks. Which, uh, should have should have brought him so I could give him away his prizes. <clears throat> Your OS is going the way of the dodo bird. This is the talk, and you can see I'm giving it on a Mac. How can I give a talk that says the Mac is dead on a Mac? Well, the reason I decided to do that is because I have a Chromebook here, and I'm going to pass it around the audience so you guys can all play with it. Now, I did have some trouble with the internet yesterday. Oh, no. Oh. And it looks like it might have trouble again. It's going to drop every 15, 20 minutes or so. Yeah, so if it does, there's actually a 3G card in here. And when you switch accounts, okay, so it seems to be working. So normally it would let you like switch accounts. If you hit this power button, it would switch accounts. But I'm, I'm worried that if you switch accounts, you won't get back on the wireless. You can try it. And if it does happen, you can use the connection up here, and you can hop on the 3G connection if you lose it. But I'll pass it around so you can all play with it during the talk. So we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what can the web do. Oh, I forgot to mention too. So this kind of, this slide kind of looks like PowerPoint, and initially I had it even more looking like PowerPoint, so I could try to trick everybody. But then since we had to include these slides, I didn't want to go actually into PowerPoint and then switch back out. So this application here, when I decided to do this talk, I said I can't do this talk if I have to do it in PowerPoint. So this is some web presentation software right here. So this talk would actually run on, on that web book on Mac, uh, this is on Windows, so it doesn't really matter anymore. And that's what this talk about is about. This talk is about what can the web do, about what's inside the Chromebook and how it works, and why your OS is dying. So we'll start off with what can the web do. So today, everybody knows you can get lots of information from the web. Um, here we see an example of a music player. Back in the in the day, I used to use Winamp. I used to use Windows Media Players because I didn't have to install everything, anything else. But now you don't need to install anything. You can just go to Group Shark right here, and kind of like how Napster works, you can put in your song title. You get shuffling, repeating, etc., etc., etc. We've got YouTube. Um, this right here is the my favorite TV show that I watch. It's a uh, Michigan politics. It's called Off the Record. Um, so I just wanted to show right off the bat that you can use the Chromebook. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, all these screenshots here, these are all taken on that device right there. Um, so it's showing that you can watch movies, listen to music. I don't have a screenshots of Hulu and YouTube, but that all works on here. Another thing I thought would be important to people is playing games. Do we have any gamers here in the room? Got a couple? Just a couple at a developer conference? <laughs> I thought everybody's hand would be up. So actually, I'm not a gamer, so I just kind of grabbed some screenshots. Uh, I don't know what this game is exactly, Ultima something or other. I went and snagged an account and looked kind of like World of Warcraft, or Warcraft 2, which back in the day, that was my favorite game. Yeah? Yep, I remember the, the demo came and I had to download it over the modem, so I don't remember how long it took to download, and then... I think I might have beat it the same day and had to order it right away. I had to wait three longest days in my life for it to arrive in the mail. Um, this is some platform game. Um, there's no animations here, but, but if you can see it, it's kind of fancy-ish. Uh, Angry Birds came out on HTML5, so that runs on the Chromebook. I don't know if any of you guys like Angry Birds. Yeah. I don't get it. I don't like it. <laughs> Even. <laughs> Oops. Missed one. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry about that. I had another one there. 
Um, I should have done Russian Attack, but I got some other platformer where it was just shooting a shooter game and people's guts would pop out. So another topic that I thought would be important to cover here are developer tools. That's one thing I haven't seen a whole lot of on the web is people using developers' tools. You know, I use Visual Studio on a fairly regular basis, um, so I thought it would be important to cover that. This right here is, is a regular text editor. So this is like Notepad for the Chromebook. One of the important things here, uh, if you can see up there, the device is offline, um, but we're, able, we're still able to use this application even though there's no connectivity. Do we have any fans of source control in the room? Yeah. <laughs> I love my history compares, my blames. Sometimes I'm trying to find out if it was me, myself, who made I couldn't have made that bug. Is that my bug? Uh, so I want to show, here's a, a web-based uh, version control system. Uh, this Chromebook has a command line. So you can get out to a command line, and you can SSH into a Linux server. So just in case uh, source control and textpad didn't cut it for you. Yes? Can you, can you nutshell real quickly the, the functional differences between the Chrome OS and, and the Mac and everything? Because so I'm not, I don't really have a good understanding of why this is important right now. So if you can just nutshell. Oh, I see. That's a good point. <clears throat> yep. So the, the big thing on the Chromebook, in case you haven't heard of it, all this thing is is a web browser. So if any of you have Chrome installed, the Chrome browser on your computer, um, you kind of have a Chromebook, <laughs> uh, but you have like a superset. So, so the Chrome operate, the Chrome browser. So all these applications are web, web yep. apps? All these applications are web apps, yeah. That's a key point that I, I did not mention. So yeah, that's why that's important, because yeah, you can't install anything on the hard drive. Everything just runs in the browser. Oh. And we'll get into more the, the larger differences later on. Um, so first, you are absolutely dependent on web connection. Right? Yep. Uh, <coughs> what you doing? This this is the only app right here that I'm showing that works without a web connection. Gmail used to work without a web connection with the Gears, but they just dropped. I think you can still get it in like older browsers that support Gears, but Chrome itself is the browser has dropped support for Gears, and they'll have HTML5 offline storage. So I'd expect Gmail offline to work and Reader offline to work. But yeah, for the most part right now, when the internet doesn't work. That thing that's getting passed around is kind of a good paperweight. Mm -hmm. How much does it cost? How much does it cost? Uh, this one mm -hmm. I got for free. The ones that are launching in two weeks, there's two different models Samsung and somebody else. One's like 350 bucks, and I think one's 450, 500, 429. <clears throat> yep. Store all of your. Things in the web somewhere. The question was, does everything get stored in the web? Yes, that's the goal. Uh, today, that one's got a 16 gig solid state drive, which I think are the specs for the two that are launching in a couple weeks. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of when it's when it doesn't work out so well. So sometimes there uh, maybe a PDF or something. No, I guess the, the browser renders PDFs. I know there was something I had to download to the hard drive to use, um, but I can't think of what it was off the top of my head. Yes. There is HTML. There is support in the newer specifications. I don't know if it's technically part of HTML5 for local storage. So couldn't you build a web app that does that and specify, you know, caching of your pages? And isn't there a way of building a, an application that runs right out of HTML5? Yep. Yep. So yeah, that was kind of weird. I don't know why Gmail dropped support for offline with their gears before enabling it in HTML5, so it would still work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a decision they made. And we don't have to appreciate what they're missing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The gentleman up here said they want everybody to appreciate what they're missing. Um, so I would expect over the next year that we're going to see a lot more apps that, that work offline. Um, probably a lot like the smartphones. Like, you know, smartphones don't freak out if there's no network connection. And there's a, Google actually has an app store <clears throat> where you can shop or look around for web apps. Yep. Apps that run right there in the browser. Uh, now, how many of those can run when you're offline? I don't know. Yeah, that was where I found all these. And to my knowledge, this is the only one out of the 20 or 25 that I'm showing that can run today uh, without being connected. 
With, that's today. Yep, that's today. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah, so I think I downloaded some MP3s to the hard drive so I could listen to those. I don't know. Why I wouldn't have had internet. <laughs> Pretty much always got internet. Yeah. Yeah, but this thing's got a 3G cellular connection in it, too. So... <laughs> also made um, offline with a huge data cap. Yep, yep. Uh, this one's got a hundred meg data cap. One nice thing about it, when you get to zero, they don't just start billing you some outrageous rate per megabyte or anything. Uh, they just say you're done and you need to get more. So that's nice of them. Uh, this is Dropbox here. Uh, so the cool thing about this, the text editor that I showed before is just text editing on your local machine, which you know, since your operating system is dead, that's not interesting. Dropbox, here, we're editing this cloud file, and that's public out on the web. So this could actually be a JS file or a, or a CS file. You know, this could be any type of file. And we're here editing it, and it's on the cloud. Um, similar to how Google Docs works, except in Google Docs, you can't edit a JS file or an HTML file. There you're editing, you know, their, their particular format. Um, so I ran into that problem when I was trying to work on websites. I could do it through Google Docs, but I had, it was kind of a hassle. Um, but through this interface, it makes it really straightforward, and you can sync up and all of that goodness. Uh, this app here is one of the online code editors that I found. Um, so here, we're writing a Python script up top, and then we're executing it down below. So I think I've got one for Python and one for PHP, <coughs> um, but I, I'm expecting to see more and more languages in that vein. And I thought about writing one for .NET, um, but I, I haven't done that yet. But I don't, I don't think it would be too hard. So I think that that's kind of exciting, because I would love to have Visual Studio Lite or not have Visual Studio on my computer anymore. I think I've seen one on the web, you see short. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be pretty straightforward, because uh, Mono's got the C-sharp um, compiler as a service. I don't know if anybody's played with that, but I, I used that like a year ago. Um, so I, I think you could just write a web interface to that, and it would work. And then I think C-sharp 5.2 is going to have compiler as a service. Uh, this is Trillion, which I used that a long time ago. And I also used ICQ in the 90s. And when I was setting up for this demo, I found out that my I still knew my ICQ number, and it still works. They didn't disable my account. So that's pretty cool. But my, my AIM password does not work. And I'll tell a story about that later. <laughs> everybody loves their office. Everybody needs their office. And I'm not sure if everybody knew, but Office is online. So this is PowerPoint. I could have given it on the web in PowerPoint. I also did think about putting the code stock slides and presenting those in PowerPoint. But I decided I really do not got to have PowerPoint. <laughs> Uh, this is Messenger running on Chrome in Windows. I don't really use Messenger either. I kind of hate it. But sometimes you got to talk to those people on it. <laughs> uh, this is Word up here. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can see it very well. Oops. But this has the, um, you know, that new bar that they introduced in 2007. The ribbon. The ribbon, yes. So you can see the ribbon up here. And here we're editing a picture, so you can see that it's a pretty good editor. Uh, and this is Excel. I don't know if you can read these names, but does anybody know? Nice. You guys nailed it. <laughs> was Washington the ringer? Pierce. <laughs> 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 you don't see that name anymore. Else, I liked it when I lived in Chicago because they had all those street names for president's names. So it was educational while I was just walking around there. Uh, these right here are all some different image editors. One thing that's kind of interesting about cloud apps is, is they don't seem to just try to do like a basic, provide like a basic paint. Like it, they kind of try to do things that are fancy or, or a little bit better. And they seem to be a lot more, you know, in a particular niche and just do one thing really well. Um, so I think if I was actually good at drawing, I could have actually made something pretty sweet with this editor here. Um, but I just wrote letters because I'm not good at drawing. Uh, 
This is my son. He's three and a half there. Uh, so I just found a regular editor so I could toss him in, in there so he could become famous. Uh, this is an org chart creator. And actually, I've had a problem on, on Windows finding good org chart creators other than Visio. Uh, I forget, there's some open source one that I used. Um, mm. But this, uh, this actually just worked pretty well. And I ended up using that for a slide that we'll see later on that describes the different Chrome operating system and Chrome browser and how all of that breaks down. Did anybody use Pavre back in the 90s? Yeah, some ray tracers in the cloud in the uh, audience. <laughs> so back then, you know, you had to render each line. Um, you know, now with the web software, you can just draw things out, and then you could have some supercomputer just render that. Although nowadays, all the computers can pretty much handle <laughs> uh, those uh, ray tracing files that I used to make. AutoCAD software in the cloud. Uh, this right here, I don't think you can see it very well, but it's actually making an animation. So if this thing was running, you'd see that it makes the C stand out, makes the L stand out, makes the O stand out, makes the U stand out. These down here are all, are all um, frames, and then it's got layers. So this is actually the first time I ever made an animation in a computer. And it was pretty straightforward, and it was on the cloud. So that was cool. Another first for me that I don't know I didn't include a slide of it, but there's an online font creator. And that's something that I actually looked for probably about a year or two ago, because I thought it might cool, be cool to have my own handwriting font. And I, I didn't find one for my desktop operating systems, but I found font struct, and so I made an A character. So I don't have my handwriting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe my next presentation will be in my handwriting, which will be horrible, and nobody will be able to read it. <coughs> These apps are getting a little bit more advanced. Um, this app here, you can create beats with it. Yeah, you can't hear this, but it sounded okay. I was impressed because I don't know anything about music, and I was able to put something together that made sense. Uh, this next one's more impressive. There was a sound editor that I used in the in the '90s, Cool Edit or something like that, maybe. Um, and this is kind of more along that lines where you can get in there and edit the, in the, edit the waveform. Um, so I was really surprised that this functionality exists out there uh, in these free apps. Yes? Is something like that actually connecting your audio jacks and your computer music for soundboard recording? I don't even know enough about sound editing to answer that. Uh, the, the question had to do with sound jacks and plugging those into the computer and having those feed up. Right. Um, Audacity might be able to do that. What? Audacity might be. Oh, that, I think that was the one I used in the nineties. Audacity. Yeah. I don't think that this Chromebook that's being passed around. I don't think it has audio jacks. I think it just has a headphone jack. Mm -hmm. So I think there's no audio in on that. On this one, down here, there's a record button. And I, I don't know if it was this software or not, but that laptop does have a mic on it. Um, so you can record sounds on there and edit them in here. Um, but probably not the high quality. Probably designed for a production use. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you could record on another device and, and just put it up into the cloud. Because, you know, all the software that's working on here, since all it needs is a browser, it works really well to use different computers that are good for different tasks and just get your data up there and then you can edit it from anywhere. In this case, where was your data <laughs> Was it already out there? Yep. So, yeah, all these services, they just let you, like, save to their... Storage, you just create an account. A lot of them use OpenID mm -hmm. or your Google account to save. Um, and then you just hit File, Save, or File Open, and it's almost like looking at a directory listing. Um, but yeah, all these are saving all to the cloud. I'm trying to think if any saved to the computer. And I think just that text editor that I showed, that was the offline one, was saving to the computer. And everything else is all cloud storage. Does it bother you at all that your stuff is somewhere where you don't have control of it? It does not bother me. I have my health data, I have my tax returns, all my stuff is up in the cloud. But I, I know a lot of people it does bother them. 
So I don't know if the room split 50-50 on that. How many people is about? How many people bothers you if your stuff's up there? Hey, where's where's the 50-50? <laughs> My main objection to putting things in the cloud like that is that companies don't last forever, especially web companies. If, if your data management persists for a year, you should probably count yourself lucky. So what what would you say would be the solution to that? To making sure that you can actually retain data if. if someone shutters their doors. So that tax return stuff that I just mentioned, I, I don't want to lose those in case I happen to get audited. Uh, and I, it seems a lot when I switch jobs, but I have uh, some zip files that are backed up on hard drives and on um, thumb drives. And another way too would be to, to have it across different cloud services, so if you've got Microsoft and Google. It's the, does the Chrome that runs on Windows and the Chrome that's running is the operating system? Is it seamless, the apps that are running in there? As far as my testing, I haven't noticed any difference between them. Um, but I, I just wouldn't amaze me if there was a bug in, in one version that wasn't in another. They have a, the same code base, but at some point it probably splits to handle the different, different, the different um, system level interactions. Has anybody seen Google Voice make calls to plain old telephone systems through Gmail? Oh, so that's not showing here. So on that device that's getting passed around right right now, you can use that as a phone to make calls, and it uses the microphone that's in there. Um, so that is pretty cool. Except that we've already already seen it. <laughs> uh, this right here was as close as I could find to a video editor. Um, so this thing lets you select some music and photos. I think actually it hooked into Flickr, Google, Picasso, Picasso and something else. And so you could just pick photos that you wanted and the text and it would make a video that is playing up here that exports as a flash file. So that was the closest thing I could find to a video editor. So unfortunately not the waveforms yet, but I would imagine We'll have that in the near future. Uh, this one here is similar to the previous slide with the Google Voice. Um, this is my son on that computer using, uh, or no, I think I'm on that computer. Um, but this is uh, video conferencing through Google Mail. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that. Uh, and one neat thing too is uh, on the Windows and Mac size, that or Voice required installing some extension. But on that device there, it just worked right out of the box. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, this is a beta that I just got into on Thursday. And this will let you run remote desktop from any HTML5 enabled browser. The only caveat right now is that on the server side, you have to install whatever company name this is, <coughs> Ericcom. You have to install that on the, on the server. Uh, so probably a future demo, I would actually log into that, log into one of my computers, but uh, I just got in Thursday, so this is one of their their things, but that's pretty cool. Is this run Java applets? Run Java applets? I don't know. Do you think of any website that uses a Java applet off the top of your head? Um, it's not. Which it's one? Websites Java. Like. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> We've got some at our company. I couldn't bring them up here, but uh. yeah, I, I want to say no, but I, I haven't actually tested it. And off the top of my head, I can't think of oh. any website that uses Java. Is it Java. Facebook's picture of Blutter use Java? I'm pretty sure it's not Flash Base. Mm, maybe it is. Runs uh, <laughs> I, I don't think it runs Silverlight either. Uh, just, is Hulu on Silverlight? No, this runs Hulu. I know that. I, I want to say it doesn't run Silverlight. Sure. So what was involved in getting the remote uh, desktop to run? You know, you said something needed to be installed. Yep, there is a, some MSI package that you run on Windows that then should have it all work. Okay. Log me in. Theory, it would run terminal services. Yeah, I think it's a layer on top of the, I think that uses remote desktop under the covers and, is, and just, I don't know, uses uh, the HTML5 ports to uh, interact with this, and I'm assuming just there's like a translation between that. So, terminal services, web apps would actually probably 
using you, Make Up in your software? Right? Um, yeah. I want to. I don't. I don't know. So it'll use the remote desktop thing, but I don't know if you just. Are you talking about um? What's that company? Starts with a V. Or? No, the to in in the one. In terminal services two thousand eight or two, you can actually do remote desktop through the browser. Oh, okay. Are you talking about like on Internet Explorer? Where it uses the ActiveX control? Uh, it does not use the ActiveX. I don't think <coughs> with R two, but used to. Yeah. Oh, cool. I hadn't heard about that. So yeah, I'll check that out. So I think we are running R two. So maybe I didn't even need this. <laughs> yeah. I think logmein.com will do that as well. Really? If you're running an OS that's not active. Uh, the Chromebook Guts. Uh, so that thing that's getting passed around now, uh, that's at launch going to be called Chromebook. Uh, the goals behind the Chromebook are that computing should be fast, it should be simple, and it should be more secure. So that computer, if you have it turned off and you turn it on, I think it's to a boot screen in about 10 seconds. And then I log in my Gmail account, I think it takes another 10 to 13 seconds for it to get into the environment. So for the little thing, about 23 seconds to log in, and maybe two of that seconds is that with me typing. Um, versus on Windows, it's a while. On a Mac, it's faster. When that thing is sleeping with the lid shut, and you open it, it resumes from sleep by the time the lid's open. So that's a big difference from my Windows machine, and that's pretty nice. For the simplicity aspect, you don't have to worry about installing software. You don't have to worry about installs going bad. You don't have to worry about installs conflicting with each other. It's just got a browser, so you don't get confused by the interface or control panel configurations, that kind of thing. More secure. Um, this thing, I'm just passing it around. It doesn't have any of my. It has my. It has some of my data on there, but all the data that's on there is under my user profile, and it's encrypted, so people can't get on there. Um, that's actually on as a guest account, and so when that's logged off, everything that people used on there will get wiped from the hard drive. And it's got a nice security system too. So, so the login screen, you can log in with your Gmail account, or you can log on as that guest account. Um, you know, whereas on Windows or Mac. A lot of people have it automatically log into their account, that kind of thing. So I feel a lot more safe passing that around. And delving more into security, it uh, so first off, it, everything runs in the browser and it's sandboxed, so it's hard for a virus to get on there in the first place to compromise your data. If something does get on there, they've planned for that. So if somebody gets on there and, and executes an attack that modifies the <coughs> Operating system. When the book, when the Chrome book reboots, it'll detect that change um, through some read-only firmware on the device, and it will. Uh, so first, it'll first, so it's got it's actually got two copies of the operating system store in there. So when it looks at the first copy, well, I guess we will get all get to that in a minute. But but pretty much, if this thing anything goes wrong, their idea is that you just reboot it and it fixes itself. And we'll talk about how that works in a minute. And that's important for a couple reasons. So if your grandma has a computer and it gets viruses or goes slow or something, she might call you, or she might go to Best Buy. Best Buy might format her machine and make her lose all her data, that kind of thing. So with the Chrome, uh, you don't have to worry about grandma, and grandma doesn't have to worry about those kind of things. And even better, from an IT department standpoint, all your users who are running the Chromebook, now their IT personnel don't have to worry about those kinds of concerns. You can focus on other things. Um, so here's the slide that we're talking about how that stuff works. Um, so at the bottom of the stack, we've got the hardware, which is pretty similar to hardware that's running all the other machines. They've got customized firmware on there, and that was where I started to dive in before and talking about how that the Chrome is able to detect when an attack has changed the operating system on there. Um, so we've got this this uh, recovery firmware on here, and it's in a read-only section of memory. So it can be written to, and it'll store two copies of the operating system on there. 
um, because Chrome can also update itself. Um, but in case one of those updates goes bad or there's a bad version on there, it'll check the first version. If that version doesn't check out, it'll go to the second version and, and say, can I load and get to a good state? If both of those versions are bad, then the recovery firmware initiates a recovery process, and you'll stick in a, a USB key, follow instructions on the computer, and it'll go and download a new known good version of itself um, so that that virus or malicious software or broken <coughs> software will not be on your computer anymore. Yes? How long does that usually take? I haven't done it, so I'm not sure. I think I've read some blog posts about it, but I don't remember if they mentioned the time. I'm guessing it would be pretty quick, because I think the image is small. Maybe 500 megs, I want to say. Something like that. Um, the verified boot, uh, this is the part of the firmware that, that handles figuring out if the image is good or not. Also, it does like a checksumming signed signature process to do that. Um, fast boot, to speed up their boot, they took advantage of the fact that they know what hardware they're running. Uh, so they, they do things where they know they don't have a floppy disk, and they have parallel, paralleled a lot of operations and deferred a lot of operations to get that fast boot experience. Um, then we'll go up to the kernel level. So they're running an Ubuntu kernel with some small modifications. Most of the modifications are to speed up the boot process. And they have some policies on refreshing the kernel. I think it's every six months or two version changes. Um, so mm -hmm. then they pull the latest version of the kernel and put their changes in there. And that's what they run with. Um, moving up another layer, there's a window manager, and then there's the Chromium browser. <coughs> the window manager is kind of hard to notice because for the most part it stays out of the way. You mainly just see the browser when you're interacting with it. Uh, but they do have... Other windows, which I don't think I have any good screenshots of that, but if you're watching an MP3, or listening to MP3, sorry, it'll put up a little window that's over top of everything. And then we just like play, pause, music on it. And you can double click the uh, like taskbar looking thing, and it'll, it'll just kind of hide out of the way. That's and you can, what's that? That's a separate app, it's not just part of the Chrome. I think it runs a Chrome window, that's, but it's on top of everything. Um, so that way, if you're like browsing your email, you don't have to switch windows to play, pause, fast forward, rewind your music. Uh, and the Google Chat, that works the same way, too. Mm -hmm. So they've got these little like pop-up windows. And then Chromium, the web browser, that's got the JavaScript V8 engine. It's got a built-in Flash. Um, I don't know why Adobe's on there, but it's also got a built-in PDF viewer and HTML5 and WebKit. And then on top of the web browser, you've got your web apps, you guys have your extensions, and websites that you're browsing, and all those run in a sandbox. So that's what provides for the speed, safety, and simplicity of the Chromium book. Any questions on this slide? Did they say that there's any plans to allow you to install the OS on another box? Yes, you can do that. And there are people who talk about it on the mailing lists. It seems like people have trouble with that. Uh, I haven't done it. Okay. Yes. Do, uh, uh, obviously, as time goes on, you know, uh, applications are going to get more and more uh, processor intensive. Is there any plans to allow people to uh, upgrade their hardware once they buy a Chromebook? Or are they just stuck with what would they have until they buy a new one? I think you could upgrade your book. I guess I'm kind of thinking that most people would just get rid of it and get a new one. Um, that's actually probably what I do with my computers, too. Back in the day, I would upgrade the processor or hard drive, but now it seems like it's easier to get a new one. I mean, my opinion on that is Google doesn't care, they're just, they're just making a soft course, it's the horror manufacturers who would decide. That'd be, you know, it's just hardware. So. Yeah, and uh, Google gives you control over your, your book too, so, so if you want to root that thing, all you have to do is pop out the battery and flip a switch, 
and then you're rooted. And I don't know if you can install Windows on there. I don't know if anybody's tried that, but I think <laughs> it, in theory, like you can do whatever you want on there, and they don't care. <laughs> you want the hardware? This is the Intel chip. It's a uh, that one is an Atom something or other processor, and I think the ones that are going in stores in two weeks are dual core Atoms. Um, I haven't played around with like uh, was it Grub and Lilo or the the uh, Linux boot managers, and I'm not sure how that would work too. You might, maybe if you did root it, that maybe then you could do that, but I haven't tried it, and I have not, I don't recall anybody in the forums trying the dual boot. But I think actually on like, uh, like people are actually trying to run it on MacBook Pros and on Dells and things like that, and I would imagine they're doing dual booting there. But the hard drive is as small as you said it was, so you're going to be limited. <laughs> yep, it's got a 16 gig solid state hard drive. See, I don't know how much Windows takes up, I don't think 12 or 20 gigs. Four applications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does it have a local file storage system? Yep, it does. So if you hit Control O on there, it'll bring up the local file browser. Um, See so if you if you download anything on there, it'll stick it on the hard drive. If you take screenshots, it'll stick that on the hard drive. What's the battery life like on um, I think when I first got it, I ran it for eight and a half hours, eight hours before it died. Yep, no CD-ROM, no floppy, solid-state drive. Processor display. Yep. The less is going away. It's just what they're trying to do. Yep. So the common advantage on one here is that the OS isn't going away; it's just getting thinner. And I think it's a good segue, segue into the next point: your OS is dying. And just like you stated, it's not dying like it got shot; it's dying more like it's got cancer, or like it's a landline telephone, and people just don't really care about it anymore. So th this kind of computer seems well suited for like entertainment and web browsing and like kind of office work. But I don't know that that uh, the computers, you know, with full on OS installations would ever go away because there's so many business and industrial applications and um, things like that that depend on either demanding that they're going to be local or else just the horsepower isn't there to do things in the browser. Yep, so the comment by the gentleman here is that that uh, there will always be a requirement for local storage and horsepower that that the web won't meet. I think that's true today. It's like today I can't run Visual Studio on the web and I can't run SQL Server Management Studio on the web. But what I can do is I can buy an, or lease an op operating system from Amazon mm -hmm. and I can remote desktop into that. I'm saying use my Chromebook and then I've got, I'm leveraging a lot more power or to even flip it too, I can have a website where I go to google.com and now I can search all of the web in a fraction of a second, whereas my computer couldn't do that maybe in its lifetime. Uh, so I don't think we're there today, but I think going forward in the future that we're going to see, see more and more the compelling benefits of these web applications and that they're not, not, not equivalent to desktop computers, but actually better. And I think the best examples of that are not the screenshots that I showed of all these applications, but I think the best examples are things like Gmail and Google Calendar. Almost like, like Outlook. I never want to use Outlook again. And I never want to use a, actually any desktop email client again because Gmail just works so well and provides so many benefits over top of any, any desktop client. And I think the same would be true for, for Visual Studio too. If Visual Studio was running on, on a Microsoft hosted server and was nice and fast, <coughs> and I didn't have to worry about upgrades and installs and conflicts and rendering problems, uh, I think I would really, really love that and pay a premium for that instead of having my, my desktop experience. 
so I just mentioned that your, your OS is dying slowly. It's got cancer. My OS died about four years ago. So in about 2007, I was trying to figure out, you know, I'm on different computers, and I want my data to come with me. How do I do that? My first attempt was to have a flash drive where I'd put all my important files on there that I wanted to go around with me. And I quickly found out that that didn't work. I had some images, luckily, that got corrupted early on. And I was like, oh, this, is, this sucks. So then I moved up to server storage. I think at the time I was using SkyDrive. <clears throat> and that worked out really well for me. So then I was able to have whatever files I wanted on my computer at home, able to have whatever files I wanted on my computer at work. It was kind of inconvenient because I had to download the files to use them. And the other inconvenience was that my videos and music didn't fit on these services because the storage capacities were too small. Uh, but both of those aren't problems today. So today, as we showed earlier, now I can edit my documents in their native form online. And the other problem I mentioned with the videos and music, now instead of storing all that stuff on my computer, it's just stored off on YouTube or on GrooveShark or any of these other services, Hulu, and I can just pull it down when I want to watch it without having it take up all the space on my hard drive. Um, so I've been on the cloud for about four years now, and I haven't looked looked back. That's just for my personal. Um, like you said, I haven't been able to have my Visual Studio up there in my SQL Server Management Studio, and every time I need to write my resume, I've had to, <laughs> had to use Word. Um, but my personal life has all been up on the cloud, and that's worked out really well for me. And I think that's just the cost, kind of like we saw landlines maybe eight years ago or so. That some people were, were not having landlines anymore, and they were just going to the cell phone, and it seemed kind of crazy back then. But now I think we look at people who have landlines and kind of scratch our heads and wonder why, since everybody has a cell phone. And three years, five years from now, I think it'll be the same way with operating systems. Uh, I think a, another good example of that, I used to love Windows. I was, I was this huge Windows fanboy, and when they were working on, uh, I remember it was Windows XP, where they were going to have the, the WinFS and all these cool features, and I was excited about it, and I'd read about it. Uh, when Vista launched, I didn't care. When Windows 7 launched, I was on XP, and I didn't care. I just get them now whenever my employer puts them on my machine, and I don't care. Windows 8, they, they had their big announcement. You don't care. I, I don't care. I, don't I, I was curious. Though. I, I've been wondering about it for a couple of years. I, a couple of years ago, I was in a uh, Redmond meeting with some people on the, from the Windows 8 team, <clears throat> and I was like, man, let's, I was telling about this problem. I'm like, oh my, I don't care. I don't care. Is my, is my operating system going to make me coffee? Is it going to drive me to work? Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't really care what it's going to do. And they're like, oh no, just wait. Mm -hmm. It's going to be cool. <laughs> and then they announced that they're doing HTML and JavaScript on the desktop. OK. <laughs> uh, how about you guys? Is anybody here excited about Windows 8 or Mac next? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, what we really care about is our applications, and the operating system is kind of like a tax. It gets sitting in between us and our applications. Is this I necessary? care about how much trouble they're going to make for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Windows, Windows 7 does have one cool feature. When you hold the Windows key and you move your arrow keys left, right, up, down, and the things hop around, that is my favorite Windows 7 feature. <laughs> On the Mac, uh, one of the features that I like, oh, it could sync with my Google Calendar, which was kind of cool, but it wouldn't do it automatically. You have to actually like, go into the application for it to sync. So if you hit that button that like brings up your calendar, it's wrong until you actually launch the calendar application. So that kind of sucked. And then uh, Mac has, that con has a contact sync, um, but that really sucks because it seems to sync on some schedule that it wants to sync on, and I can't like force it to sync. Uh, so it was out of sync a lot of times, <laughs> and then uh, it would randomly go into sync. And I saw a lot of form posts that were scary in that regard. I think yes? What you're saying is true for the consumers. But for businesses, there's all kinds of proprietary and legal information that have to retain, have to be retained in-house. And, and that the cloud is, is simply just not, not feasible, not practical, and in some cases may not be legal. Yep. Yeah. I was in Chicago a year ago, and I was talking to a security analyst, and he was freaked out about the cloud. 
Um, he was talking about them violating their service level agreements blatantly. Um, I think there was some company that had their email hosted, and like I think any technician at the company had access to go through the email. Um, so he was all freaked out about it. But I, th I think it's the flip. I think that actually these uh, these cloud services are in a better position to provide security. Seems like uh, so. Yeah, that that's the big like. Uh with the cost savings that companies could get from from having less staff and, and IT staff to maintain their networks, the big you know, like there might be a rise in like data syndicates that specialize in one sort of industry or another, like whether it's banking or um, uh, insurance, a syndicate that where they could trust their data. Mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, if you're an insurance company, I don't want my internal data going to Google, but if there was some industry syndicate, maybe so. But that's a single point of attack. I was just about to say that. That's a great place. You're, you're concentrating all of your targets yeah. in one nice, juicy spot location. The Walmart it's called the target rich environment. Yeah. yeah, and I think some of, the, some of those big companies are, are already big targets, like uh, Sony. Sony. Uh, well, I don't want to say Sony. I was thinking more of the, the defense contractors. Uh, they just had some articles on NPR. Like, yeah, yeah, Lockheed Martin. You know, so some of these companies are getting attacked constantly. Um, so they're talking about like when should a company publish, when it's been attacked, and when not. So they were saying that uh, the Department of Defense gets attacked off those millions of times per day or per week. Um, so when you really look at that, um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think that companies are in the best position to defend against that kind of thing. They might feel more safe because they're doing it themselves. Like I might feel safe if I built my own lock on my house, but it would probably actually be better for me to hire a security company to do that. I'll get this guy and then you. And just a question: How can I access the underlying Ubuntu or some preferences or the operating system behind uh, the Chrome? Uh, so the only way to do that right now on that one, you can get into a uh, command prompt, and I forget the for key for that. Uh, if you Google, if you Google uh, CR forty eight command prompt, I think it's like Control Shift T maybe or something like that. Um, uh, but it's a very limited command prompt, so you'll be disappointed when you get there. Um, <laughs> but if you if you flip the dev switch on it, uh, so if you pull out the battery and flip the dev switch, uh, then you're rooted in there, and uh, and you can you get your regular Linux environment. Yes. Can I try that? Can you try that? No, please don't. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a blog I follow, and they say like before you do that, you're supposed to have your backup USB. Floppy, uh, in case you want to. Uh, but if all your stuff is in the cloud, the cloud, what do you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? It could possibly go wrong. The only thing that could possibly go wrong is that then I have to like fix it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so it might be unusable until I fix it, would be the only downside. And yeah, and my stuff is in the cloud, so actually, like, if I, if, when I pass it around, if somebody ran off with it. You know. If you did fix it, could you time to download the recovery list? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, we had a question over here, Dan. Yeah, I, I, we were just talking about the you know, security of data when it's outside of your control, mm -hmm. and about the subject of the Lockheed Martin attack. And the, you know, they recognized very early on they were being attacked, and their solution to the problem was unplug. And so they immediately disconnected. Now, you know, okay, they were disconnected, but they were still functional inside because they still had access to all of the hundreds. Whereas if it had been outside, they wouldn't have the option to disconnect. They wouldn't have had any control over uh, 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 fixing the problem mm -hmm. you know, the Those are the things you get up with. Plus, there's safety in numbers. Well, I mean, there's, sure. but if there's a lot of different companies, then attackers have to pick one. Yeah. And, you know, we. You know, we at NC State, we're using Google Mail now, and so are a lot of the other universities, but a number of us have been sued now because of the handicap accessibility. And, you know, that, you know, that we're violating some of the laws, and we're having to look at that. Or put that on Google News? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't have much to say about that. So yeah, yeah. you know, there's there's considerations, and my my theory 
which will be proven out, <laughs> is, is that uh, you know you get economies of scale, and that'll be better for for companies to do that uh, in the early days. You know, the individuals might be better, and also to if if uh, regulation lags, so it doesn't actually deal with the reality of of what's out there today. Um, you know, if they make rules where you have to have your data on site. There's not much to do about that except to go to a different um, legal jurisdiction. You know, let's use a lot of years for, you know, Windows to actually get handicapped to accessibility. But during that time, you know, it wasn't that vital. Now it's become vital. And yeah, and you mentioned, uh, um, you said NC State? Yeah. Yeah, so for NC State to make their website handicap accessible, it costs X. And maybe for... for uh, uh, Michigan State University, it costs X. Um, so we know we've got like two X. Let's use rough approximations. Again, what you require it is part of the student. The students have to have an email account while they don't have to access the web. Right. Okay. okay. So so then so then MSU is going to leverage that investment across forty thousand students and NC State. I'm not sure the size, but you're going to leverage that across N students. So that's, then, so that's then, why they want to Google is because we didn't want to spend that money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you go to Google, and then Google's able to, to take that same cost, yeah. but now leverage it across. I don't know if they've got yeah. three hundred million users or something like yeah. that. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the big drivers. Um, the the lower costs of doing it online, and then the better product actually doing it online. So I'm going to say that it's not better for the companies to do it themselves, but for them to outsource that expertise. Now, the students that need that special access, they can turn on POP3 access in Gmail and use any client they want. That would be true, but yeah, with the Google Apps is the other issue. Yeah. And see, by, by going that direction, rather than the volume campus site license, there's all sorts of things that come about. Um, one thing I kind of <clears throat> like to note is we're developers, right? We solve problems. Uh, if this is the future, then the people who solve these problems will be making money because they've solved <laughs> these problems. So if you have a concern about, yeah. you know, security bed in the cloud, come up with a way to get past that, and the world will love you. <laughs> yeah, well said. One of the things I find interesting about all this is um, when there was an internet but no web, I worked for a company called ADP Network Services, and that's what we did. We rented time on our machines and space on our machines for people to do their stuff, and then it all went away. You know? And you know what were the reasons why it went away? You know? I mean, we did that for 10 years, 15 years, and then people said they didn't, yeah, they didn't want to do it that way anymore. Timeshare was the beginning of, of sort of the computer age, and that was what drove that. It's fluctuating back and forth. Yeah, I've definitely heard that before that people talk about being cyclical. Mm -hmm. I'm not old enough to have seen the first cycle around, so I don't know why it didn't work the first time. Well, uh, I would guess that the, the networks weren't fast enough. The computer was extremely expensive. You didn't have it everywhere. And so, you know, my first job was to clear the terminal, and I was terminaling into a machine. And all the space was in there and all that stuff. And then PCs came along, I pulled out the space easy, and I had all the people in there. And now we're reverting back to the big data set. Well, it's in the it so richness of the interface. See, that was why. We, had, we ended up going away from, from terminals with, because you could have a much richer experience. The first things in the 90s trying to convert stuff to the web, you would lose 30-40% productivity because the, the experience wasn't that rich. You can, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, well, they used, for data entry, they used you know, they were used to doing heads-down data entry, and you couldn't do heads-down data entry on the web back then. Um, you still can't to a degree, but JavaScript <coughs> makes it a lot easier in Ajax than these things to, to sort of simulate that. 
you you still don't have the total rich experience, but you're probably getting close to good enough. Yeah, I think it's kind of amazing. Back in the in the nineties, we had gray screen applications with the spinny E that was in three D, mm -hmm. and the email counters that ran on CGI, and, and that was pretty cool. If you had a website with a with a counter on it, mm -hmm. and and then 10, 12 years later, we've got you know the experiences that that you were talking about these. <laughs> it's kind of hard to differentiate, or some, sometimes you can't even differentiate between desktops and, and web apps. Um, and you're doing local validation of, of data, yep. you know, and, and that's a big difference, with, especially with heads down data entry kind of stuff. Back? I had two questions. Uh, have you tried printing from it? Yes. So the way printing works today is. Um, I think on your uh, on on your Windows computer, you go to your Chrome settings and you add a cloud printer, um, and then and then that hooks into your in your Google account, and then when you're on your device, when you say print, I believe that your PC has to be on for it to print to the printer. So you still have to have the printer installed on some of the machine. Yep, and. So they're working to have it so it'll be able you'll be able to print direct from the Chrome to the printer. They've got a I want to say driver specification, but I don't know if that's the if that's the right terminology. But in when the when the printers come out that support this new technology, you won't have to have that PC inter intermediary that you do today. And I, um, HP and another manufacturer are launching printers that support the Chrome print uh, this year, if not. At, will be available at launch, I forget. So is that Chrome print that you're talking about different from what you see them doing in ads right now, which is web printing from, say, your iPhone? I have not tried that or heard about it. Printing. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. And the other question I have is, has anybody tried hacking the firmware to connect to a, a private cloud? I haven't heard about any hack attempts. I think there's only 10, 20,000 of these books out in the wild now. Um, right now, that their defenses protect against somebody who doesn't have physical control of the device. So if an attacker gained control of the device, you can do whatever you want in there. So you can put your own firmware on there. Well, uh, I, I don't know if that answered your question. Well, if you could just talk about the line company sets up a private cloud, buys 10 of the books, wants to hack it so they have 10 salespeople that attached. Yeah, if you, if you root it, you can force it to go to a specific IP address as uh, its primary data. Okay. Well, that answers that question. I guess I just assume that they only have a device. That's not the case. Is it hard to go to Google Google? Well, I mean, you could run some sort of web app inside Chrome. I mean, that's what Chrome's, you know, made for. You could, and then it could connect up to whatever cloud storage you wanted. Correct. So when it when it starts up, it's gonna look at itself to make sure that it's got a Google signed image that it's about to run, and then it's gonna load that image. Uh, then when it boots up or after it gets booted up, it's gonna check for updates from Google. So in the attack, the it sounds like you're describing is that maybe you're saying that this private cloud would pretend to be Google and no, give it a not talking oh, about that. He's talking about doing an internal intranet cloud service, an intranet service. So that comes, so your sales your salespeople are accessing your own private cloud for storage. Actually, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, be just a Sorry, yeah, I'm running inside it. Chrome. Right? Yeah, I missed it completely. Yeah, I think it's like this gentleman saying there that yeah, you could just um, this supports VPNs and yeah. and uh, networks. There's nothing to lock it to, just the information that's on my phone. Well, yeah, what I was saying is if you root it, yeah. and you, you, can, you do have options yeah, yeah, like that. Then Chrome would not come into play. You do not yeah, have yeah. to. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's just a radio network device. Exactly. It, it, Out of the box, it will connect to... My network here on isn't connected to the internet. Yeah. Right. And actually, it's, it's easier to do that with, than, than maybe other computers because it's open source. So you can browse the source, and there's forum posts and things on how to modify different aspects of it. Say so if you wanted to do something like that, I think it would be easier on this device than on others. Especially since the fact that they give you rights to it out of yeah, the box. Right. So yeah. 
Remove the battery, flip the switch, all that. Good. But I mean, the whole purpose of that would be sort of, you know. Well, no, his, yeah. his point is he wants to limit his access from yeah, that limit device to, to an intranet yeah. service. Which is the that same thing could happen is if your if your Wi-Fi network is only able to get to your internet. Yeah. It's the same yeah, thing. I mean. Yeah, if your network doesn't have access to the internet, then you're done. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I want to see the first people who actually decide to give their entire sales force. So. Chromebooks, that'll be unique to see. Actually, have you heard, um, one, one of our clients, they were, they've got about 10, 10 20 employees, something like that, and at, they bought them all iPads, and so they're trying out using iPads for their primary computer instead of their Macs or uh, PCs. And it goes along with this kind of tour, where, where it might not be that this is the killer, but just that your operating system doesn't matter, you know, as you said, it, it it's thin and nobody cares what operating system they're using as long as they've got a web browser. We you know whether that's an iPhone or an iPad, Android tablet. As long as the apps are web apps, they run everywhere. I'm a lot more excited about the next version of iOS than I am about any other operating system. So. We could better figure out how to get Angry Birds to run on there or something. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't, I didn't tell you. Angry, Angry Birds is on there. Oh, is yeah. it? Is there a way to produce a context menu or a white click? Simulated on that because I try getting the right side of the mouse pad. Uh, I, yeah, I think. I think you hold control. You gotta remove there. Oh, that's <laughs> all. Okay. Yeah, Angry Birds and Minecraft both work on that. <laughs> Actually, the last coming out was that. Somebody there had, um, I think it was it Steam. <laughs> there was some some video game service, but it would run instead of like bringing the software to your computer, it would run on the server and send the screen changes. And the frame rate was above thirty. I don't know if it was at forty or sixty, but it was an amazingly good experience. Not on this network, no. <laughs> <laughs> not not on the two bars. Not. Nah. Okay. It's on my. It's on what? Oh yeah, on live? Sure. Yep, so that's cool. Uh, actually, I did try to get Quake on here for one of the samples, but it needed um, ActiveX, I think. So it looked like it was cloud, but it wasn't. And actually, I think it was out of the Chrome. Is, I think an HTML5 implementation of, of Doom or Quake. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. See, that's what I got to find. That would be better than the, than the uh, <laughs> crappy web apps that I found, <laughs> or web games. It has you know, more powerful wow about it. <laughs> We had Quake hooked up on our high school network back in the day. That was fun. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't have the Google patent. <laughs> oh, you're talking about last summer when they made their Google page? I was just thinking about that. I think it's slash Pac-Man. still there. <laughs> That's my requirement for any computer. If it doesn't have Pac-Man, I'm going to get that. There you go. They killed a couple hours times like 50 people in the consulting company I was at last year. Yeah, there was this news in the agency saying the hours had been lost during that week. That would have been awesome for Google to publish those numbers. We just cost the U.S. $3 billion. <laughs> Domestic product. We will, we will succeed to our demands, or we'll do it again. Yeah. Don't make us put Defender up there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so we get nothing done. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Good sessions. Well, thank you.